Welcome back to The Couple. Today I'm joined by mon ami, François Morin. Uh, François is a uh, early guest on the D Couple podcast. I think that was even before we were up on YouTube. So François, the, uh, the guests will get to see your beautiful face. Um, but we had a, a really wonderful episode again in those early days of D Couple. I think it was titled, Is China the Future of Nuclear Energy? Um, you, sir, are, I think, still the uh, World Nuclear Association lead uh, for China. Um, I'll let you clarify that in just a second, but um, we had, a, I think, just a great episode, uh, went a little bit into your past. Um, you know, you're a fascinating person, at least to me, uh, speaking fluent Chinese and Russian and French. And, and I think we'll send people back to that episode for, uh, you know, more content there, because I'm so eager just to get a sense of what is happening in China, which really seems to be um, the place that is moving most rapidly or, or where there's the most developments happening, whether it's just pure pace of deployment. Um, whether it's deployment of uh, you know new technologies, um, molten salt reactors, high temperature gas reactors, um, the, uh, the the small modular reactor, the ACP one hundred, which I think is probably the most advanced in terms of a uh, grid connected small modular reactor. Um, so, Francois, uh, thank you so much for making the time and joining us again. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Thank you for having me again. I think it was uh, three years ago. Yes, that we had. Uh... Wow! And then yeah, that was. Um, I think so. The early, early COVID period. I was in France at that time yeah, because yeah. of the COVID. Now I am back in China. That's right. That's right. And uh, you, of course, introduced me to François Perchet. Uh, we had a great episode on the preconditions of the Mesmer plan. So just to kind of steer some of our listeners to the earlier catalog, you know, we're two hundred and thirty-three episodes in. So for people that have joined recently, um, I always like to give a uh, you know a little recommendation for something to dig up in the past. So Francois, yeah, again, let's let's uh, again. It was three years ago. So give a brief introduction of yourself. Um, f- feel free to sort of draw on some of some of your your past. I find you to just be an absolutely fascinating person. Um, so oh, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pass. That's probably simpler. That that's probably simpler than what you may imagine. Uh, I'm a senior engineer. Uh, graduated in uh, physics and mathematics and thermodynamics. I worked in the French Atomic Energy Commission in a research department. Uh, for uh, my uh, short uh, thesis about uh, biology, I was working in uh, in biophysics, um, and uh, but then uh, after that and a few some other episodes, I joined the nuclear industry, and I worked in the design of uh, reactors in France, um, and I was particularly in charge of the so-called uh, post Chernobyl studies, and then. Uh, and then I moved to uh, nuclear medicine for a while before doing other things, big projects, infrastructure project in uh, in Africa, in South America with Chinese. And finally, I joined uh, 12 years ago the World Nuclear Association in Beijing. Wonderful, wonderful. And so, so Francois, again, I, I'm, I'm trying to sort of think back to our first episode, and I think it's useful to our listeners to have a bit of a framing of the context of, of nuclear energy in China. Um, something that sort of most stuck out to me was just the sort of pragmatics, uh, the rationale behind uh, the pursuit of nuclear energy in China. Something that you said again that stuck out was uh, that the majority of the coal reserves are in the northwest and a lot of the population is in the southeast. Uh, I think something like 50 percent of all rail traffic in China is moving that coal towards those population centers. Uh, and that was one of the the big drivers. Can you, can you talk uh, about some of those historic drivers and maybe the more contemporary drivers as you see them now? As you talk about coal, just let me say one word about that. We've seen this year again a uh, um, significant increase in uh, coal uh, use in China, you know, a plus 4.3 or 4 uh, percent, which is uh, which leads also to an increase in CO2 emission by, by nearly the same amount. Um, the thermal electricity in China grew by 6.5% last year uh, altogether. I mean, gas plus coal plus uh, oil. Um, So these things are not changing. I mean, this is the background. And uh, whatever the hope is to uh, go as per the new governmental instructions and Mr. President Xi Jinping instruction to uh, reach or to target Uh, zero carbon in uh, 2060. Um, We don't see yet the carbon peak, which is targeted by 2030. We don't see it arriving. 
So on the contrary, we see only 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 rise. Um, regarding this, this uh, you you mentioned the geography of China, north and south. Uh, China has consumed last year 4.6 billion tons of coal, um, of which uh, six near no 550 million were imported, and they were wow. yes, and they were imported from the south of China from uh, southern countries like Indonesia, Australia. I don't know. I didn't see the numbers, but. Uh, they, at least they were imported from, from, from Indonesia. So you see China is even importing uh, coal. It's importing 65% now nearly of its oil consumption. It's importing uh, nearly the same, nearly 60% of its gas consumption. Too. China produces a lot of gas, but it's just barely enough to, to fulfill half of its uh, needs. So, um, so uh, in such... Uh, and this figure is um, not getting better. I mean, in, in a sense, it's, it's not getting more more uh, Chinese. It's just getting uh, every year worse and worse in terms of the ratio of imported things. Um, however, yes, China is a strong now uh, manufacturer, exporter of energy or energy-related things like a solar panel and, uh, and a wind turbine and so the, the most impressive thing from the last year is the investment in, uh, in so-called uh, renewable and new energies. They named that new energies. The altogether, uh, electric cars, batteries, turbine, a little bit of hydro, and the solar represented uh, 800 billion euro of investment last year. The solar itself uh, represented maybe uh, 10%, nearly 10% of that. 80, let's say 80 billion US dollars were, were invested just in solar panel and, uh, and solar systems. Mm, it's an, it was an increase of uh, plus 50% compared to the last, to the year before. Um, and, and it's, uh, it's an, it, it means that now they have, uh, um, how many? I forgot exactly. They installed um, 60 gigawatt of electric of solar electricity last year, and uh, now the the total capacity of uh, of solar is uh, around 600 609 gigawatt of solar capacity installed. Can you imagine that? Wow. And still, solar wow. solar represent only uh, only a tiny percentage, of course, of the production, three point three percent. That's unreal. Okay, so if I can try and summarize some of what you've said, um, huge capacity additions um, in. We didn't actually talk about nuclear so far, but we'll get there, I'm yes. sure. Uh, but in in all sort of traditional forms of uh, electricity generation, as well as the renewables slash new forms of generation. And, and no real progress um, towards uh, the climate goals, towards peaking of emissions in 2030. I hear uh, a lot of analysis. Um, there's certainly a lot of you know breathless um, optimism about the pace of renewables deployment in China. It seems like the overall percentages, as you said, are not changing massively. It's not that solar has gone from being, well, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe. It's not gone from being sort of like 5% of total generation up to 20 or 30 as it is in some places, say in the US or Australia. Um, it's increasing, but everything else is increasing as well. So there's not a, a huge sort of relative change, or, or am I off on that? Nuclear is increasing uh, significantly. Of course, we have between the production and uh, and uh, the, I mean the construction and the production, we have five six years difference. So what we see today in terms of electricity production reflects what the decision taken five six years ago in terms of construction. But still, we had a small growth of three, nearly four uh, percent from one year to, from 2022 to 2023 in uh, in nuclear uh, production. Uh, but it stays at five percent of the mix, as you say, and uh, and there we don't see any possibility to go <laughs> beyond this five percent in the coming at least five years. The target, the Chinese... Because everything else is growing so much. Everything is growing. And what is funny, for instance, is when you consider the, 
the amount of uh, data, the, the, the electricity re, um, demand for uh, the data centers in China is growing not faster, but nearly the same pace as nuclear electricity. So the more we build nu nuclear, the more we are maybe able to follow with the data centers new requirements. But that will not, it will not, I mean, it will not replace or challenge the other uh, needs that are uh, fulfilled now by uh, thermal or, or, or hydro. Or, so it's, it's a very challenging thing now. Uh, however, the, 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 you must uh, not forget that first, the governmental target is to reach 15% of the electricity mix by 2040, let's say. Um, From nuclear. Maybe a little bit earlier, maybe a little bit later. So 15%. And even without considering the future, if you look at the map of China, um, you have a big province. The, the nuclear is all on the coastal area. And the, we have provinces with uh, 100 million inhabitants or six, 60 million or 80 million inhabitants, as big as countries. And in, in these provinces, the nuclear share in the mix is uh, 12%, 20%, up to 25%, depending on the province. So uh, Chinese know how to have a relatively high percentage of nuclear in the mix. You know, it's not, it's right, not something right. we should not um, get stuck on this uh, 5%. You know, that, that's true uh, for the whole country, but there is a large part of it which uh, has not yet uh, considered nuclear. So just to clarify, um, the relative proportion of solar and wind, have those increased, say, more than the relative, you said nuclear sort of stayed stable about 5%. Um, have the relative uh, contributions of wind and solar increased? If so, yes. by kind of how yes, much? Yes, the wind contribution uh, increased by nine percent, and uh, and the wind uh, wind is nearly it's not not twice, but it's uh, one point nine times nuclear in term in terms of production, and okay. and solar okay. is uh, below nuclear, but uh, altogether altogether they may they they, they make. Uh, Three, not three, but two point five times nuclear. Right, because you know I, th I think one of the concerns with intermittent sources is at certain levels of penetration they start to cannibalize each other's values and and start to impose uh, excessive costs in terms of grid services and and transmission, etc. From what I understand, China is still at a relatively low, despite the absolute numbers there. You know, what was it? Eight, uh, Sixty gigawatts added this year. It's still at relatively low proportion relative to its dispatchable forms of electricity. Is that is that correct? Yes, yes. The the overall uh, capacity is uh, now it's nearly three thousand um, three thousand gigawatt. Yes. So if you add sixty, you you have the proportion. Yeah. It's sixty over over three thousand. So I think what you've painted here, for me anyway, um, is a real problem of energy security. Uh, importing that amount of oil, um, I gather a lot of it's from the Middle East. We're seeing uh, Israel and Iran launching attacks at each other over the uh, Straits of Hormuz um, or over the Persian Gulf anyway. Um, so that 65% dependence on oil, uh, a real concern. Similarly, gas. I mean, very interesting that they import a significant amount of coal. I, I guess probably a bunch of that is, is uh, met coal as well as just their thermal coal. But one of the things I've heard is that, you know, the big drive, and, and I understand the uh, penetration of electric vehicles is quite high in China, a big drive for that is to diminish dependence on imported oil uh, and try and become more energy dependent more broadly through electrification um, to, particularly in the oil front, um, try and try and reduce uh, that dependence. Is that jive with, with your sense yes, of things? Yes, this, this is what, yes, we usually, this makes sense. I mean, it's common sense. However... When you look at the real picture, if China wants to electrify more its energy system, so it might um, have twice as much electricity generation in 2050 compared to now. So mu multiplying all that by, by two is an enormous challenge. You know, so if, uh, <laughs> particularly if you want... But you're... you're you're in China right now, just anecdotally. I mean, 
I hear that there are a huge amount of electric vehicles being uh, put on the market every year in China. Do you see that out on the streets? Um, yeah, and is that cities, contributing yes. to in, improved air quality yes. and things like in, that? In big cities, yes, of course, we see now. And uh, they have quite a, um, quite an efficient uh, system. You know, the taxi drivers, they, 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 they don't charge their batteries. They go to the garage and, uh, and, they, and they take a new uh, a charge battery against uh, the empty one. Um, I mean, not all of them, but many of them do that. So uh, it, it, it works. They, they, don't, they don't, I mean, they don't feel the shortcomings of the, of the electric vehicle because they, they are not concerned by the charging. Regarding private cars, of course, they must charge at home or in some dedicated places. Um, it's, it's big numbers, but uh, it's still only for the big cities. Hmm? In terms of, um, you know, some of the changes maybe since we last spoke three years ago, and I really want to get into, you know, what's happening with deployments inside China, um, the rate, the pace, the reactor technologies that are being chosen, et cetera. Um, but before we do, um, China, is it starting to emerge as, as more of a nuclear exporter so far? I think we have some reactors exported to Pakistan. Um, I'm not sure about anywhere else, but it seems like with with such a bustling industry and with this kind of geopolitical soft power that being a nuclear exporter gives you, uh, China is very ripe to move into that market. Are we starting to see uh, that that happening? Yes, uh, China exported uh, successfully to Pakistan already years ago, and uh, intends to do more. Um, one uh, one important uh, for them uh, target was uh, UK for uh, uh, selling the their Hualong model. Um, they spent a lot of money and time and energy. Uh, in uh, getting the GDA, General Design Assessment, approved by the UK government, as they were somehow promised that they would get after their financial involvement in Inkley Point, they might have this opportunity to get a, a site Bradwell for building two Hualong, two units. Um, hoping, uh, betting on that, they prepared all the documentation they spent maybe I don't know I don't know the figures something something around twenty million pounds, or maybe thirty million pounds, or to, in four years' work, four years and a half, and then they were kicked out. So they have they have been very very disappointed. Regarding other places, they have uh, yes they tried to uh, to they they went all around the world. Uh, in Africa, in Kenya, in uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, in, uh, in even in Ukraine, um, in Romania, in Czech Republic, in, uh, but they were slowly also um, somehow kicked out of this, uh, at least in in, in European uh, side. Um, they have also they had also another target in uh, South America, in Argentina, but with with the new president now. We, we don't believe that the conditions are good for having the uh, confirmation of the Hualong project in Argentina. But who knows, you know, but it, it may change uh, rapidly also. I mean, so you've been around long enough to, to remember the Cold War and re- remember, remember the, the different blocks and the, the non-aligned countries. It sounds like uh, we're emerging into a new multipolar world that's... Uh, Kind of along similar lines as that old Cold War, with Russia and China uh, being the the powers that are sort of um, I, I don't want to say in, in opposition necessarily, but you know the what the world's the world's divided again along pretty similar lines, uh, and um, China's not finding its way into uh, you know Western or Western influence markets. So it sounds like it's going to be more Africa, some parts of South America potentially, but it, it does sound like the, a little more constrained. One one interesting remark regarding this uh, energy war now, as a con- which is a consequence of this new Cold War. Uh, sometimes you can see in the, in the newspapers uh, some uh, comments on the Russian uh, gas and oil uh, sold to China uh, at a discounted price because uh, Russia has no would not have uh, any other solution, any other market. Uh, I disagree with this point <laughs> because China is in extreme need of gas, for instance. Uh, according to all forecasts, by 2040, uh, China alone could swallow 
all Gazprom production. It would, it would just fulfill its national need. So there is, a, of course, uh, maybe there is no, from the Russian point of view, maybe there is no competition outside China, but China itself is so much in need. I, I, I believe that till today, China is more in need of Russian gas than, than Russia is in need to sell its gas. It was very interesting. I had, uh, I'm going to butcher his last name, Stefan Stepinski on. He's a uh, Bloomberg uh, gas trading journalist um, or journalist on the, <laughs> on the gas markets. Um, he's written some great threads, uh, particularly on Japan and just seeing some sort of visualizations of kind of the octopus tentacles of, of the Japanese energy strategy in terms of all the places it imports its gas from, its coal from, et cetera. Um, China, you know, again, getting back to this energy security question, um, is vulnerable in terms of moving a lot of Persian Gulf oil, I mean, out of the Persian Gulf, but also through the Straits of Malacca, um, the island chains, um, you know, in the, the South China Sea as a, as a zone of conflict, um, but very easy, you know, just geographically, I was reading a great book called Prisoners of Geography, and it really explains why countries pursue the strategies that they have and make the territorial grabs they have. And it's, it's not because of the whims per se of a, of a you know, particular political figure, it's just basic geography. I mean, you want to control the highlands or the sources of the great rivers. So you go and you make sure that you have it in Tibet rather than the Indians, for instance, or the Russians, you know, being so concerned about Ukraine and those kind of Northern plains that sort of leave an unobstructed entry point into, into Russia. And similarly, you know, Chinese, uh, you know, security imperatives to control that, I think it's called like the first Island chain, um, and control the South China sea. That's, you know, from a, uh, geopolitical perspective, that's to be less vulnerable to naval blockade. Um, there's there's a few sort of straits that they can move through, I think, between Taiwan and uh, and one of the Japanese bases, uh, Okinawa, where the, the U.S. military has a big base. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of surface-to-ship missiles systems all throughout there. I mean, China is really hemmed in and really vulnerable, I think, to energy blockade. So I think that that speaks to, like, why there's such a strong Russian-Chinese alliance building, you know, in this new pipeline uh the trans-siberian pipeline i believe it's called um it's it it, it power of I, just, I, I just love understanding yes, power, of power of siberia, siberia. Yeah. They, will, they will double it uh in the coming years and uh and still it will represent only a tiny portion of, of chinese uh, uh consumption um of course geography plays a role outside china inside china too um you know they had uh, some plans uh, for instance 10 years ago to increase uh to double uh, the hydro uh, uh, capacity that was uh, 300 uh, gigawatt at that time. And, but now, after um, thorough consideration, investigation on the capabilities offered by rivers and mountains you know, to get hydro power, uh, in fact, it's, it seems that the, the highest limit is uh, 500 gigawatt. And today, China has uh, capacity, hydro capacity, of four, 422. So they are getting... So 80 gigawatts remain. Yes, yes. So it's why they cannot count on that. And this, and this is... Um, all these gigawatts are produced in the west part of the... Central west part of the country. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, it's full now. And so they have to find... Uh, other other means well, while we're while we're on the topic of geography um water cooling for thermal plants seems to be an issue in in the kind of more arid interior of china and i think that might be again why they are pursuing some alternative uh, reactor concepts and designs uh can you speak to that uh, i don't i don't think it's a question of water cooling i i think it's more because they, they know how to have now this uh, Powers and uh, and there are enough uh, water resources, uh, not maybe not enough for uh, hydro because it's not the lack of water for hydro; it's the lack of mountains, <laughs> which, yeah, which is, yeah. <laughs> and uh, but uh, for cooling the the plants, it's not the question. The question is the fear of release of radioactive material. Um, this 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 fear was um, uh, became very very. Uh, sensitive issue after Fukushima. Mm, and uh, because uh, the, the, the population is so numerous on the downstream of potential sites that uh, because of that, uh, they, they fear that if any, any piece of water would be contaminated, 
then uh, they don't know how it would be managed. It, it was it was very interesting seeing uh, China's diplomatic objections to the Fukushima water release. Uh, there was some data looking at uh, some operating Chinese nuclear plants um, that were releasing far greater amounts of tritium into the water. Um, so you know that that was interesting and and kind of attitudes uh, towards radiation uh, in China. That's that's a kind of interesting topic uh, in terms of um, you know it, it seems like that's kind of receding as a fear in the West right now, um, paradoxically maybe, but. It, it's they will use again for in the coming years this question of Fukushima, post Fukushima water, you know, just just to put a to throw a stone in the Japanese garden. Um, but I believe the Japanese garden can can stand more stones. <laughs> it's mem- it's even the specificity right. of Japanese gardens. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, they I I, I think uh, they will also build uh, nuclear plants uh, inland. Because the number of sites, the number, if they want to reach, let's let's go to some some figures not briefly. Uh, now we have 57 gigawatt of nuclear capacity. We have no uh, settled target for 2050, but there are many rumors, uh, uh, options, uh, discussions um, to go up to maybe 500 gigawatt of nuclear capacity by 2050, which is more than the whole world today, which also means that it would uh, consume the whole, uh, more, more than the uh, 65,000 tons uranium uh, that that are consumed um, every year today in the whole world. Uh, But even if they don't go as as high high as that, uh, let's say if they target uh, 350 gigawatt, plus uh, 30 gigawatt for uh, heating, uh, heating dedicated reactors. But even with, uh, even with uh, 350 gigawatt of nuclear capacity, this cannot be uh, reached with the coastal sites only. You have 47 uh, uh, coastal sites and approximately the same inland. Um, we have already this 57 already installed capacity. In some sites, you can have six reactors. In some others, you can have only four. Uh, so all, all that considered, uh, the coastal sites cannot uh, exceed 250 gigawatt approximately. So, so this means that they definitely need at least for 100 gigawatt uh, build uh, reactors uh, inland. And I mean, we have the example of Palo Verde in the U.S., uh, a reactor in the, in the arid deserts of, uh, of Arizona, well, I think actually four reactors there. Um, so certainly it's, it's, it's been done. I guess the question is, does that require non, um, you know, light water reactors? Does that require, you know, different coolants and moderators? Or you said there's enough water and yes. we can build no, there is no, no, no water. light water reactors? Water is not a problem. I would even say that. There okay. is too much water. <laughs> it's uh, the threat is much. It's more the flood than the, than the than the lack of water. Right. But uh, no, the question is uh, just a question of safety. But provided that the, it's guaranteed that there will not be any uh, radioactive release, even in case of accident, then uh, they will start. It has been advocated la- this week again by several important people. Um, to, uh, to to start building inland uh, reactors. They, after Fukushima, they stopped. It was officially said that they would consider after 2020. But now it's 2024, so they must uh, rush to, to get some installed before 2030. I believe that before the end of the year, there will be the first uh, authorization for starting a, a plant, a reactor, uh, on inland side. Got you, got you. Yeah, I was I was just on the World Nuclear Association website looking at the China um, uh, China webpage. Excellent resource, I must say. Um, but yeah, you see this real kind of exponential curve, um, sort of 2010s to 2020s, and then it kind of slumps. Uh, and I guess that's because of the kind of Fukushima hangover, and we're probably going to see another exponential sort of hockey stick uh, coming very, very shortly. Um, so, I mean, things are certainly humming along. 
um, you know, in my brief kind of review of, of uh, the history of Chinese nuclear, really a buffet lunch of reactor technologies and vendors that, that were selected, the Americans, the Europeans, the Canadians. Um, I think uh, the, only, the only countries that have not sold reactors to China probably for historically, uh, historical geopolitical reasons are Japan and I think Korea. Uh, but you could you could fill fill me in on some gaps there. Um, but it does sound like um, China is indigenizing technologies, make, becoming fully sufficient, uh, self sufficient in um, in those technologies. And it, it seems like we're narrowing in on two sort of contenders uh, for the kind of future at least gigawatt scale light water build out. And those are the Chinese AP one thousand and AP fourteen hundred, which is a derivative, and the Hualong one. So I'm very interested in. Uh, first, maybe you clarifying my my initial statement there in terms of characterizing the buffet lunch of uh, of the history of Chinese nuclear deployments, and then yeah, where we're going um, and which technologies are are emerging as kind of the standardized uh, nuclear plant for the future builds. The decision to have uh, diversity in technologies was taken uh, in two thousand and seven. Uh, the, the the Chinese plan um, was first to to work with the French in the 90s, in the last century, 1990s. The first plant, the first reactor started and connected to the grid in China was a fully Chinese reactor. So they might have gone this national way uh, all the way right to now. And there are some Chinese um, people who say, I mean, experts in nuclear, who say we should not have bought this um, Western technologies. We should have gone our way. The Hualong itself, which now seems to be uh, important in the, all the plans, and uh, we have 11 Hualong under constructions today. 11. And four operating. So it, it seems very important, And but uh, it, it started also 12 years ago. You know? The design and the, uh, all assessments around the, the Hualong started many years ago. Uh, however, the decision was taken, yes, to, to have a very diverse uh, uh, origin of, uh, of the reactors. But it's the same, it's same in Finland, huh? Finland, which is a six, six and a half million inhabitants, <laughs> has also three or four technologies. Um, so, so the, yes, so they have opted first for the French, then the, then the, the Kendo and the, the, the Viviar, don't forget the Russians. Uh, yes, we have four yeah. operating plants and uh, four under construction. Um, and uh, also, uh, yes, the DAP, the famous AP-1000. Um, and, uh, and, and, and their own new options like a CAP-1400, yes. All these, all these reactors are now either working, either being under construction. Regarding a new Kendo, um, I know that uh, Canadian are uh, somehow positive about the possibility to sell the new Kendo reactor, uh, which is, uh, has been uh, uh, agreed in terms of development with China already some years ago, the ACEFR, whatever. Um, I don't see that, I don't see the, 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 the room for it in the current picture. But uh, it's still possible. I know the French also would like to sell more EPR. Now they have two EPR in uh, in in, in, in Taishan site in Guangdong province in the south, and they still hope that they can sell Taishan three, Taishan four, as EPR. Uh, I don't see such a Chinese decision uh, soon. I may be wrong, but I don't. I don't see. Right. Okay. So let's. Let's let's uh, unpack that. I mean, first off, maybe just kind of rapid fire questions here because I don't want to dwell too long on any of them. But you said the first um, Chinese reactor uh, connected to the grid was fully Chinese indigenous technology. Um, was that based upon prior? It was a 300, US 300, 300 megawatt. They... 300 megawatt, which okay. was started in 87, 87 maybe. Wow. FCD. Okay. Okay. Let's 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 kind of fast forward then. Um, so the EPR and AP one thousand experience in China. Um, like looking at the median build times, um, you have, uh, I think there's two reactors that were built on a, on a shorter time schedule in terms of shovel to, uh, to breaker connection. Uh, but, you know, waving my little Canadian flag, the can did pretty well. I think, uh, you know, 
third and fourth quickest deployed at you know four and a half five years uh, but the median build time in china is five and a half years and the ap1000 and eprs took just under 10 years so why why is epr not being pursued and and why uh, is the indigenized ap1000 continuing to be deployed epr and ap1000 were uh, competitor in uh, in in 2007 and there was an official bid at that time a national tender and uh, the ap1000 won that so it, it makes sense uh, now to, to see that they have more AP1000 than EPR. I would say that uh, the two EPR in Taishan were given to the French as a compensation to have lost the tender. So, uh, uh, yeah, so, so I mean, there is no, not much more interrogation about that. Now, if you look at the price per kilowatt, for instance, the, Chinese yuan per kilowatt. The the, the AP one thousand are more expensive than the EPR. You have a kind, yes, you have a kind here. Maybe maybe a kind of a smaller a scaling effect, which is not uh, very often seen in nuclear. But uh, we can we could consider yet yeah, that the difference of price between EPR and AP one thousand comes from this uh, scaling effect, which works here. Just because the EPR is is a massive, yes. it's uh, seventeen fifty yes. versus 16, the AP one thousand yes. eleven hundred. Yes. Is it the largest? Is it the largest reactor like ever built? But they have. So that being said, though, they have their own. There, there's not plan, any huh? also Chinese, which which comes from an evolution of the AP one thousand, and uh, that uh, he's fully Chinese, uh, entirely uh, free of uh, right, intellectual property rights uh, uh, to to Westinghouse. And uh, which is 1,500 megawatt, roughly. But there is a new, uh, a new version, which is to, to come after the first two under construction now in uh, Shoda One Base. Um, and the new one might be 1,700 mega, megawatt. Okay, just, just on that topic. Okay, so just, just to kind of uh, maybe wrap a bow on that, um, there are not any new EPR. Uh, reactors planned despite the lower <clears throat> per kilowatt construction costs is what I'm hearing, at least compared to the first AP-1000s. Um, but there are, uh, you know, the Hualong and AP-1000 seem to be emerging as the kind of standardized down selection. How many Hualong are being planned? How many uh, CAP-1000s or 1400s are being planned right now? How many Hualong plans? There are maybe altogether, we see, I told you, four now working in operation. 11, 11 under construction, and maybe behind that we can see 30. So that that would mean that would mean uh, between 45 and 50 uh, Hualong at the end of the end. AP 1000. And, and what about the uh, cap? Yes, AP 1000 will remain below that. Uh, AP 1000 uh, had uh, this uh, market perspective uh, to uh, have a lot. Uh, like uh, 70, 70 units in China. That back back in 20, 2012, it was the the, the forecast. But um, now, no, nobody can believe that, and um, we more expect something between uh, fourteen units, one four, and eighteen units maximum. So the Hualong sounds like sounds like the winner here, and, and the Hualong is based on the French three loop design. Is that the kind of uh, yes? Origin in terms story, yes, or? in terms of uh, global yes, it 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 looks like somehow yes, but but with uh, new features, uh, including of course the the passive safety system, which requires a lot of uh, additional uh, concrete and and steel, fifty percent more, fifty percent more. Because, because this is you know without without going too off track here, um, my understanding of kind of origin story of the EPR is that this was you know the European pressurized reactor. They tried to harmonize lots of different regulations in Europe, and ended up with the harshest regulations uh, from each country, leading to a design that is harder to build, has more concrete and steel uh, involved, uh, double containment. I think for trains, etc., safety trains, um, and that's a criticism that I hear. I mean, and we haven't seen you know. And we're going to talk, I think, a little bit about negative and positive learning rates, but it, it seems to be a reactor that's been difficult to construct. I mean, the AP-1000s in the U.S. also quite difficult, but I think much more economical in terms of concrete and steel, et cetera. Uh, 
Do you, do you see that? Is that an accurate portrayal or am I, am I way off uh, Not fully. As I just told you that in terms of cost per kilowatt, EPR is cheaper than AP1000. So uh, uh, yes, the construction time here maybe plays a role, but not that much. You know, when, when your reactor is, to, is supposed to, to work 80 years, 60 to 80 years, you know, five years delay or plus or minus, is not really significant. <laughs> Something you can say in China, I think, that you cannot say anywhere else in the world right now, or certainly yes. in the West. But look, the, the AP1000 construction time is uh, quite high, 107, 107 months, nine years and, and, and two months in, 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 in average. So, uh, and it has not uh, seen uh, significant... Uh, decrease due to learning uh, aspect of the construction. Um, the Haiyang, uh, the Sandman 2, I must double check, the Sandman 2 was maybe a little bit uh, uh, shorter in time to Sandman 1, but not, not, not really much because they had this primary pump problem and they had to sell the primary pump back to the U.S., and, and get a new one, and this happened several times. Um, so uh, uh, they lost time in the in this particular case. Um, the 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 Hualong compare the, compare to the the EP one thousand. The Hualong is a 80, 80, 82 month construction time. But here also you have an interesting feature. The first two Hualong made by CNNC in Fu Sing site uh, just across the Taiwan Strait. This one are, have been much shorter in, in, in construction time uh, than the Hualong made by CGN in uh, southern China coast. Uh, and those required nearly one year more. So, and, and the second unit was not shorter in time compared to the first in both cases. So this goes this goes against all of the aspirations that we hear. You know, in the West, we have commitments now to triple... Uh, nuclear energy by 2050 coming out of uh, you know a, a COP declaration by I think 30 nations that signed. Interestingly, I don't think China was a, a signatory to that particular declaration, but they're the most credible to actually <laughs> deliver and maybe deliver that all sort of in country. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm, uh, I'm curious uh, about that about um, you know this 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 phenomenon that we see of actual negative learning rates and. We would think, I think, in China with a really teed up supply chain, um, you know, everything that we're sort of lacking in the West or maybe what France had in the 70s and 80s, that those those ingredients, those core ingredients seem to be there in terms of a, you know, you know, large and, and highly qualified workforce, whether that's craft labor, uh, engineers, uh, project managers, et cetera. And what you're telling me is we're still not seeing much in the way of, of uh, positive learning and certainly not consistently. Like one thing I've heard is that sort of on site, you know, if you build several reactors on site, typically you see a cost reduction. You, I guess you have some counterfactuals there, uh, but you don't necessarily see that between sites or between states uh, within a within a country or between countries. But let's yeah, let's let's dive may, a little yeah, bit into this. You may have question. yes. On one side, you may have a, a kind of a learning effect which uh, applies for for the cost. Yes, maybe why? Because you mobilize less. Probably you need, you need less capital, maybe for all the cranes, all the infrastructure, uh, everything which is around. Yes, but even even on one side, you don't see, as I just told you, you don't see a decrease in in terms of time. Construction time remains the same, or even higher. Why? That makes no sense. Why? <laughs> because it's not because it's not a play. Learning learning effect exists in many industries. In oil industry, in car manufacturing industry, in uh, in, uh, in plane uh, manufacturing, of course it makes sense because all these things can be. I mean, that sometimes they require a big infrastructure, but this infrastructure can be cut into pieces, um, which is not the case in a, in a, in a nuclear uh, plant. Um, you have an extremely massive uh, amount of concrete. Um, which, uh, uh, I mean, it, you have, the, 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 of course, the steel, but you have also extremely heavy equipment. So you must have dedicated crane for each 
for moving each equipment. Sometimes you have to build the cranes in order to <laughs> to move the yeah, equipment yeah. on site. And uh, it's why, for instance, moving one crane to a site is considered as a nuclear news. You know? Oh, we they moved yeah. they moved the crane on the, on the Sandman Three, <laughs> uh, right. and uh, and uh, the thing is too big to be uh, to take advantage of any kind of uh, learning effect, and is extremely um, site dependent. Um, operations go, and um, of course, on uh, they follow a planning uh, schedule, but. Uh, Unexpected things happen all the time. You know, the weather is not what you wanted. Uh, the the transport of the equipment is not what you expected, um, and there is there is no way to control that. There is no way to make a, to 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 make it modular. We have a kind of modular AP one thousand. Yes, okay, but still, uh, you know, ten years construction. I mean, to, to be charitable, it sounds like, and, and we've really deep dived this question, uh, and we do have the, the the beauty of having a sort of case control study, uh, you know, the U.S. versus China, where you don't have, you know, you do have a, a, a strict regulator in China, but it's not quite the NRC. You don't have the air, aircraft impact assessment rule. Um, you have a very, you know, h- highly skilled project management workforce and craft labor workforce in China. You don't have that in the States. And yet, Vogel took, took 10 years, maybe 10 and a half, and and Sanman, et cetera, the, the sites in China took nine and a half years. So the common denominator seems to be that the design wasn't finished. Um, now the design is finished. Some people say, okay, well, you know, you can move quite a bit of the AP1000 construction, you know, into more of a factory environment in terms of creating those modules. So we should see a, a you know, a significant change um, without all the design reviews and, and changes. Do you do you share that that optimism or you're, you're smiling? Yes, so, I, I smile because... I think the key in the in this uh, Chinese speed, if there is a Chinese speed, because even even in China construction time are rising instead of decreasing. Rising, yes. If you take all together, I mean the AP one thousand, the, the the EPR, the Hualongs, and you compare the construction time today to what it was before, it's just it has just increased by twenty percent. So uh, uh, yes, even in China, construction time is increasing. <laughs> and uh, okay, so uh, th- th- there's this. Uh, it's the question of design. The ahead, solution is uh, the capital. You know, how much money do they put at the beginning from scratch, not only on site to build to 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 the, for the concrete and steel and construction, but uh, also for the equipment. You know, I have seen several times myself in several um, uh, equipment manufacturing uh, com- uh, company factories in China. Um, equipment finished already. Equipment that cost tens of uh, millions of US dollars each, or like the steam generator for for the CAP fourteen hundred. I don't know, but the cost I they didn't <laughs> disclose to me the the cost, but uh, it may be something around thirty thirty five million US dollars. And uh, and these two steam generator, for instance, in this case in Shanghai, they were lying in the factory. They were ready. Can you imagine that? This this uh, uh, seventy to eighty million uh, US dollars stock here, immobilized here, and uh, with without uh, getting their return. I mean, without being fully sold. Um, because they were waiting for something to happen on because, the critical path of the construction. Were, no, site. because they were because they were launched. Early in advance. Ah, okay. But the launching of a big equipment requires uh, 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 is extremely uh, capital uh, demanding, you know. And we don't accept that in the West. We shall not launch in advance the construction of a big equipment. I mean, we shall not uh, mobilize tens of millions of US dollars if we have no clear agenda. Uh, the, the, a, a clear schedule in which we would at least minimize the the, the, the the number of months or years. In this case, it was years. Uh, but the Chinese, they can do that, yes. So they, 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 they lose in terms of uh, profit, but uh, they can do it, yes. Okay, and, and what you're saying, though, is we're still seeing a 20% increase in schedule 
over the last few years? Like, is that driven by the AP1000s and the EPRs that took nine and a half years? Or are we seeing Hualongs or, you know, I'm trying to think of a stable design that's been around for 10 or 15 years. Are, are those reactors also starting to take longer to build? Uh, yes, uh, Hualong is uh, also today is still uh, six and a half years. It's more than the supposed five years. It's close to seven years. So you got to go back. It's seven years. If you want to build something fast, you, you got to go back to can do, it sounds like. <laughs> I'm just kidding, maybe. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, th- this is interesting. I had a guest on recently. He had a brilliant quote. Um, I've been trying to find the source of it. He said it was Euripides. Um, but he said, uh, you know, the quote is, you know, man is blind until he has a metaphor or I guess an allegory that allows him to see, right? And, you know, nuclear is just so different and distinct. And I think a lot of errors in terms of how we think about it occur because of the metaphors and allegories that we apply, the category errors that we make. And so the, one of the famous ones I think about is uh, the, the Silicon Valley tech investor who is a techno-optimist, has made a bunch of money, is turning to more, um, you know, uh, aspirational goals of fighting climate change and says, wow, there's so much potential here in nuclear. There's so many beautiful narratives. There's so many ways... Uh, that this technology can address all of its problems in terms of proliferation and waste. And I've disrupted a lot in Silicon Valley. Um, I'm a tech disruptor. I'm going to come to nuclear and do the same. That's that's kind of one category where you apply, um, you know, a career in tech and think that that is, is applicable maybe to nuclear. I try and, you know, struggle to find, you know, imperfect, uh, but maybe superior allegories or metaphors for nuclear. And what I come, sort of come back to is, you know, nuclear is a lot like hydroelectricity. Uh, you know, big capital, high risk construction project with a, you know, you know, high value asset, but valued over many, many decades um, that can underpin a lot of, you know, economic well-being that produces cheap power eventually. Um, And obviously there's differences in terms of the operation of a hydroelectric facility doesn't require, you know, workforce of hundreds. Uh, But I find that to be, especially in terms of wrestling with these considerations of, you know, how, how much can we speed up construction schedule? Um, what are some of the hard limits or, or what are some of the, the limits imposed by the the characteristics of the technology itself? Hydroelectricity and nuclear seem to be sort of the closest, um, you know, at least within that narrow frame. Still very imperfect metaphor, allegory, but probably superior oh, to a lot of the no. ways. Nuclear is not like a gas plant, not like a coal plant, you know. No, it is not. And you're right. I, I even would uh, push the allegory further. I would say, yes. Sure. Uh, I would say nuclear is closer to a, uh, road construction, you know, to bridges and, and, and tunnels. You, know? you expect a tunnel to be built in, a, I don't know, one year. And then all of a sudden, there is a big part uh, that you could not guess because of the geology, and it needs new tools and new equipments, and then, oh, you, 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 you lose one year. That, that, that's, uh, nuclear is closer to that. Nuclear has nothing to do with uh, uh, airplane industry. You know, airplane industry, you have, you put pieces all together, uh, and, uh, like the chairs inside. And, uh, but, uh, it's, it's, uh, you don't have this kind of, you cannot split the nuclear, even if, if even AP1000 tries to make that modular. But this so-called modularization is still extremely huge pieces, you know, of uh, metal. And uh, so it cannot be compared, yes, with gas plant. Gas plant is just a Lego, Lego kind of pipes. Yeah, I mean, so let's let's yeah, I'd like to I'd like to expand on on that that question of modularity because that's that's really been pitched as sort of the salvation of the nuclear industry or the way to to speed things up, and I think it's compelling. I mean, move mo- the higher percentage of work from a unproductive construction site to a highly uh, sorry more productive uh, factory site where the labor costs drop, where you can have uh, more efficiencies that are that are built in if you have enough orders to justify, um, you know, modular f- module factories and and uh, module assembly plants, et cetera. Um, what are what are your thoughts about uh, you know the the panacea? I'm not trying to frame the question in, in that way. What are the promises of of modularity in nuclear? Because certainly they have been made. They've been tied basically to small reactors, but um, you yes. know, that's certainly been something that's being chased. The the, the can do's at Kinshan, for instance, were open top. Um, there's a lot of modularity involved in that, and maybe that helps explain the fast construction time. What are your thoughts on on modularity? It's at least it's a project to have modularity for small modular reactors. Um, but uh, I saw interesting thing uh, that few months ago when uh, uh, Exim Bank in US decided that they would afford long-term loans for uh, SMR construction. 
uh, long terms of 20 years and uh, low, I forgot the number, but uh, low interest rate. This will be the key for building SMR, not the modularity, <laughs> the low interest rate and the long-term loan. It's what the Chinese do. Uh, 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 and it is the, it is the key. It, the key is in the money. Uh, now, now, regarding the modul technical modularity of, uh, as I think we, we already talked about that last time, I, I forgot, but uh, uh, for me, the key in SMR, yes, M is modular, it's nice, it's beautiful, but the M, M for modular will not work without an M for many. If you don't have an order of 20 or 30 at once, what, what will be modular? Your design will be modular, but your construction will be one by one. You know? <laughs> so, and how do you, get, how do you get 10 orders at once? How do you get that? Especially if the sticker shock of the first of a kind or the third or fourth of a kind is, is you know, these are going to be more expensive than gigawatt scale plants on a, on a per megawatt basis. Um, so that's, that's something, and, and especially at first of a kind designs and they all are first of a kind designs at this point. And, you know, maybe that brings us to talking, uh, about the ACP 100, the, the Chinese small modular reactor that's under construction, just seeing some pictures and videos, this thing still looks like a massive plant with a small reactor pressure vessel. Like it doesn't seem like they've scaled down the civil works all that it's much. It's what the Chinese tell me, you know, they said me, I didn't visit it yet, but I'm supposed to go there someday. And uh, they told me, hey, don't expect the thing to be small. You know, it's 15 meters high and uh, it looks big. In fact, it, it doesn't look much smaller than the neighboring uh, Hualong and uh, maybe smaller than the Hualong, but not than the CPR 1000, for instance. So, uh, so yes, the ACP 100 is a so-called uh, small reactor. Um, it will be connected to the grid by probably early 2026. And what's the, what's the rationale there? Is this is this, is this to start powering um, you know Chinese military bases in the South China Sea? I mean, that's still a pretty large reactor for that. So, like, where are they thinking of deploying this? Why are they pursuing a small uh, reactor in the setting of you know these extraordinary additions they're planning uh, up to you know hundreds of gigawatts more nuclear? This ACP 100 is not the only Chinese uh, SMR design. Uh, even at the IAEA, there are 10 registered uh, different uh, Chinese design for SMR. And, uh, and if you add on the top of that the dedicated to uh, heat uh, production SMR in China, you have um, that, makes, that makes at least 14 different designs. So 14 SMR in China. Yes, an SMR for district heat makes makes you need you need a small smaller reactor it needs to be sited closer to the population center. Um, you know the the megawatts thermal are are you know still quite a lot even in a fifty hundred megawatt reactor. Like it seems like that is really the bull's case for SMRs. Is SMRs for is, district heating? It, it is the same as in uh, in the US. It's uh, replacing the coal plants, particularly in the north. And the coal plants, as you said, is um, they are in the cities. So if you put an SMR in a city, or very close to a city, you need to be absolutely certain of its safety, that uh, you will not need to evacuate the whole city. So the question of the EPZ emergency zone is very important here. Um, uh, I know that the countries are not binded by the IAEA recommendations, which is to have this five kilometers uh, emergency zone for evacuation and so um, I know that. However, the countries follow the recommendation of IAEA. And uh, so this problem of uh, putting uh, SMR in on, on coal sites, on coal plant site, this will be solved only when some countries like the US, which have already, which has already gone through this step, but plus China, plus maybe another country plus the IAEA, if they come to a, cons a consensus. And this consensus still today, even if the IAEA is working positively on that, but it's, it still seem to be, it seems to be remote enough from now because uh, it's not in their IAEA mentality. IAEA does not consider the design. IAEA considers only the quantity of uh, radioactive material. 
So, right, right. And, and sorry, so these coal plants that are looking to be replaced, they're district heating coal plants or are they uh, power generation coal plants? For both, you're right. If it's only for a kind of, a, uh, what they name a pool reactor, they have a, four different designs for a pool reactor by different companies in China. So you have uh, uranium in water, the water gets hot and you... <laughs> It's a, you, 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 you supply it, I mean, through one single loop um, uh, at uh, 90 degrees centigrade, roughly. So it's... A, That's got to be cheap. That sounds, that sounds cheap, yes, like pool yes, reactors, it, not, it, not very expensive. It's cheap, but Chris, it doesn't work in summertime. So it, 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 it's the it's same, same shortcoming as, as solar, solar panels, who do not, who do not, which do not work at night. So this heating reactor. Well, so you don't need. I guess you don't need it in the summertime. It's not that it doesn't work, but you just don't need it. Yes. Yes. Opposite problem, but still, still a problem. Yes, opposite problem, sure. but similar. I mean, yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a big concern for the for the profitability of the thing. You know, the right is cheaper, but it must be. It must be. It has to be uh, half cheaper, hmm? not a little bit cheaper. So, so again, just just to sort of try and pin you down on what the Chinese SMR strategy is. Um, competition. You know, there's probably some more kind it's of competition. What's that? The key is competition. You know, uh, three, uh, four, four. I mean, in terms of international markets. No, no, between themselves. In terms of international between, markets. Between themselves, four, four uh, um, companies, uh, uh, and each of them having two or three designs. But but like why why is China looking to deploy SMRs if they're saying we're going to add hundreds of gigawatts of nuclear capacity in China, which is a country with incredibly huge demands, big population centers? You know, like I understand in the West there's a rationale for pursuing modular uh, small reactors, and that's you know big time social license. It's we're never going to get governments to pony up billions of dollars. It's um, you know I, I, frankly a lot of it is, is is social license related. I mean maybe that's the case in China. Um, but I'm I'm curious, like, what is the use case in China? You mentioned district heating; that makes a lot of sense to district me. District heating that uh, would be for you know, small small power um, reactor. Yes, of course, uh, less than uh, around 100 megawatt uh, thermal. Yes. Um, so, so what are the other use cases for for SMRs in they China? They have, they have, they say they have remote places in China. You know, from Tibet okay, to Xinjiang gotcha. to Gansu. They, you have, uh, even in the south, in the mountains, you have many many remote places. Where, where it's difficult to bring uh, electricity, uh, I mean, uh, at low cost. And uh, you have also islands. And uh, yes, you mentioned, including the military ones, <laughs> yes, in southern China. Um, and uh, you can also have this modular type of thing by piling piling uh, uh, reactors as the, for the high temperature reactor. The micro Yes, yes. Yeah, no, the, the, the high okay. temperature reactor okay. is... Uh, 200 megawatt, but they intend to have uh, three times the same reactor in one more compact unit to have a 660 megawatt um, reactor in the future. So they are used, yes, individually for remote places, for um, also exploration uh, sites in the sea, in the South China Sea. There is, it's not very deep, the water is not very deep, and the uh, they have many projects of uh, oil extraction on the coast uh, bordering Vietnam. Um, it's in dispute, by the way, with Vietnam. <laughs> but uh, they, they intend to, uh, to get this oil out of the sea and uh, they need electricity for that. So they may have a floating uh, kind of plants. I mean, it, it's so interesting because in the West, we're in this phase of just imagining all these applications. We're trying to chase climate change solutions, looking at nuclear um, to do things like process heat to, to you know get remote communities off of diesel, um, you know barge based nuclear for you know a variety of those kind of applications, uh, you know advanced nuclear concepts, and that's all in our imagination. It's all in our head so far, basically. Even grid scale SMRs, you know, potentially Ontario will lead on that, but but China China is in an active process of actually doing all of these things. Um, so maybe maybe just touch on the high temperature gas reactor, the molten salt reactor. Um, large nuclear. I mean, there's like, we could talk for hours and we won't be able to today, Francois, we'll have to have you back, but maybe just catch us up on those, those few things. So, yes. Yeah, so your question is about a high temperature reactor. Yes. This one was, uh, was a kind of, uh, hmm, 
it was developed by Tsinghua University. And, and, uh, and, and uh, it was not supposed to be on the market at that time. The, the first studies uh, considered that the HDR um, kilowatt would be much higher in price in terms of cost than the, the rest. And uh, that the LCOE might be uh, 18 to 20% more, more expensive than, uh, than, than the other standard PWR. So, but, but after uh, all this, uh, yes, uh, consideration of uh, carbon reduction, uh, all of a sudden we, 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 we saw that uh, heat is a, is a good thing by itself. Heat has value. So uh, the HTR become after, I would say, after it started construction. You know, it started in 2007, but after it started construction. <laughs> uh, no, it started, I mean, the project was, but uh, the, the, the FCD must have been 20, 2012, I think. Yes, 2012. Uh, but anyway, at that time... That's the first concrete pour? Yes, uh, for the HDR. Mm. And uh, but but uh, anyway, uh, nobody had in mind the at that time uh, the value of heat. It, it it came afterwards, and now we consider that yes, there are a lot of uh, industries that could uh, take advantage of such heat, particularly yes in in coastal China. We have many chemical industries and so on, so they could uh, they could get this uh, five hundred and something uh, degrees for their uh, chemical processes. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm trying to wrap up a few other loose ends that we had. Um, so one question, again, regarding the Hualong versus Chinese AP1000 uh, rivalry. I'm wondering if part of that is affected by uh, export controls. I know that China negotiated with Westinghouse and you know got fully licensed in terms of, I think, domestic deployment of AP1000 and its derivatives. But I think in 2018, Trump put in, um, uh, or the Trump administration, uh, you know, put in restrictions uh, on I exports of the Chinese AP1000, AP1400. Um, I imagine that's, you know, would be disputed and that would be less of an issue in a Chinese aligned kind of uh, country than say Poland or somewhere else where frankly, it's just not going to happen. Um, is, that a, is that a reason for um, the pursuit of the Hualong to have something where there's, you know, no real export limitations beyond just this kind of new yes, Cold War? Or what do you think? Chinese construction company are on the blacklist. Yes, definitely. So this is a this is a problem, but uh, would it uh, would it uh, prevent from, for instance, Turkey from buying it? I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah. Even, even yeah. if Turkey is in NATO, Turkey has bought a Russian VVR, and uh, Turkey might as well buy um, a, a Chinese uh, CAP fourteen hundred. It's, it's still possible. It's still possible. Okay, and just you know, one last, I guess, maybe concluding question, and we're going to have to have you back to deep dive a few of these topics if you're willing. Um, is you know, I think like the the all time sort of world record for um, construction speed, you know, per megawatt capacity are the ABWR builds in Japan. Um, as I understand it, uh, you know, very modular reactor, and the Japanese just you know knocked it out of the park. I forget which site if it was the the one that begins with K that I can't pronounce. Um, but you know, like I, I think like the aspiration, the the, the hope is you know. Could we develop in a variety of countries the capability to deploy as quickly as the Japanese did with the ABWR? What was behind the speed of deployment, uh, and is that replicable uh, outside of Japan in the 1990s? Uh, I don't know well the Japanese case, uh, to be honest, but uh, I think we should not um, be extremely focused on this uh, construction time uh, obstacle. Uh, if the Chinese, uh, for instance, uh, if they deliver uh, the authorizations for uh, six to, to eight, or maybe more, 10, up to 10 FCDs a year. So this, this is the main thing, you know. Can the Chinese supply chain, the Chinese construction capability, can they have this plus 10 uh, uh, reactors a year? Uh, today, yes, they can. Uh, today, each uh, component can be manufactured by five different companies in China. So, uh, so there is not, not much problem. But if we go from five plants a year, five reactors a year, to 10 reactors a year, then the overall construction um, capability must be multiplied per two, regardless of the speed. You know, 
the, the speed is not the speed is not the main problem. Uh, the main problem. If you have if you have low cost capital, that is a, a big proviso. Yes, yes, uh, but uh, the, the physical capability uh, today do not exist to sustain the construction of ten reactors per year. Um, what exists can uh, make uh, yes six reactors per year, but ten would be that mean. It would mean that uh, you might have fifty reactors at the same time under construction. 50 reactor, yes. With, with the same, let's say, few uh, uh, handful of companies. No, it cannot be done. Yes, you must, they must uh, have uh, uh, a little bit more of the supply chain. They must increase the uh, ca capacities of uh, the main uh, manufacturers, which are in Shanghai Electric, Dongfang Electric, uh, Harbin Electric, in different places in China, but also the construction, uh, uh, I mean, concrete and steel and uh, experts in nuclear construction, yes, they must be multiplied per two. So, so China's this like, again, fascinating case study of, you know, all of the optimism and aspirations of the West um, are being tested in China exactly. in real terms, being exposed to the, being exposed to the, you know, hard conditions of, of reality. Um, like, is there anything that's not running optimally in China in terms of its nuclear sector? Because we, you know, we have this access to low-cost capital. We have this ramped-up supply chain. We have incredible craft labor, lots of tacit knowledge. We have, I mean, I, I understand probably there's romanticizing some things, but like, what what is yet to be optimized in terms of uh, this? And this is way too broad of a question as we sort of close out this interview. But are there any better, any things that stand out? Maybe maybe a better collaboration between the uh, Chinese uh, governmental uh, institutions. That the, the 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 state council wants to have uh, uh, ten reactors per year authorized in 2022. In 2022, they gave their stamp for ten reactors. In 2023, also, but in both years, we we've seen only five new FCDs. So, and why why there is such a discrepancy between the theoretical authorizations and the practical authorization? because of the autonomy, and uh, it's a good thing, it means they are reliable, of the NNSA, the Nuclear Safety Authority. The Nuclear Safety Authority has no any other agenda than guaranteeing safety. So they want to take their time by investigating every aspect of uh, one new specific project. Um, so you see, time is also here. Time, it doesn't start the counting time doesn't start when uh, when you put the first uh, concrete. The, the time start, starts uh, when they think about giving or not giving authorization. You have already, you have already this, this limit between the 10 approved, the 5 started, again 10 approved, again 5 only started. So we are losing years already, two years are lost here. Whatever is your construction speed. So... <laughs> uh, but but I think it's. Uh, I was interviewed um, years ago by CNN, uh, who asked me if I were if we would be all confident of uh, construction in China, because uh, you know they told me you know we've seen uh, so so many schools uh, which fell down during the earthquake in Sichuan in in two thousand and six. Um, because of the bad construction quality. Could the same happen uh, with uh, nuclear? So s thanks to this limited speed of authorization, I think we can be confident that this will not happen in China. Yes, we can, we can, trust, we can trust the construction quality. Okay, one, one last question, and I do promise that this, this will be the last one, um, but it's not a, not, not a short one to answer. Um, you know, with this uh, proposed scale, and listen, we see all the time, you know, commitments to building hundreds of reactors, and that often doesn't actually come true, or a tiny fraction of the aspirational goal come true, whether that's JFK calling for a thousand reactors in the US, or I think the initial Mesmer plan called for far more than 56 reactors. Um, but uh, leaving beside those examples and the reasons for them, um, fuel... Um, is that a, is that something that's going to start to become a constraint if China does get to say you know 350 gigawatts capacity of nuclear oh, yes, by, of by 2050? If China gets and, and does that mean yes. sorry yes what, and what are what are the, what are the solutions there? I mean China doesn't have massive uranium reserves. Does that mean they start looking at breeder reactors? What's 
what's like the long, long term prospects for China? Talking like 2050s out. What are the constraints? Is it is it fuel the big one? I don't think so. Uh, they have uh, uranium might be a constraint, yes, but not the fuel uh, fabrication. They are increasing now all the capacities in uh, in terms of enrichment and uh, conversion. Uh, they have a lot of uh, reactors that are supplied by the supplier, by Rosatom, by the French, by EDF, by so so for for the first loads uh, at least. And they are learning how to make uh, all the fuels for the VVR, for the Kendo, for the HTR, for uh, the EPR and the AP1000. They, are, they, they know now how to make, they have not the full uh, capacity in terms of uh, number yes, uh, per year, but uh, they, will, they will get it to, to be, to be so just in terms dependent. Of- just in terms of having enough uh, uranium fuel, like, I mean, you, you, this is a common sort of anti-nuclear talking point. If we were to scale nuclear up by X amount, we only have 60 years or 70 years of, of nuclear fuel. And obviously, um, that argument doesn't take into account sort of reserves versus resources and unexplored uranium out there. But is there talk in China about, you know, in the early days of, of nuclear energy in the US, for instance, we thought uranium was quite scarce. Breeder reactors were seen as the future uh, you know, is this is this something that's even in the discourse, or it's far enough away that no, no, it's not no. They talk about really yes, no. They, about. they they have all this in mind. Uh, CNNNC, uh, which is one of the big companies, uh, they they are now investigating how to get uranium out of the seawater. So it means it means that they are even considering that we might not have enough uranium uh, on land. So so yes, why not in the seawater as the Japanese do? Uh, however, they are still probably many discoveries to be made in China because it's a large country with unexplored uh, places. So they might find more uh, uranium. Um, anyhow, it will never be enough. It will never never be sufficient. China, if they are really to make this 350 gigawatt of capacity by 20, let's say 50, uh, of course they need to, uh, they, they, sh- they will need to, to import same as I saw said at the beginning regarding oil and gas they will need to import uh, more than half of their of their uranium definitely okay okay well i am just doing the the quick uh back of the envelope math here and getting an additional 300 gigawatts deployed as uh 10 gigawatt scale reactors per year color me a little bit skeptical um francois uh thank you uh this was this was incredible um i would have loved to have deep dive sort of each of the various um uh, themes that we touched today uh but hopefully we'll be able to lure you back in a shorter time interval than three years uh thank you for making yourself available i know you're a busy guy just got back from kazakhstan um so we appreciate you uh making the time for thank you very much chris thank you